Hi, and welcome again to these videos on dynamics of structures. We have seen that structures can be excited by all kinds of different sources. In this video, we will be dealing with objects which are in a flow. This is the example of a building excited by wind or of an aircraft which is flying at a certain speed. So, as an example of flow-induced vibration, let us look at the example of uh, wind hitting a building. What you see here is that um, the velocity of the wind can be decomposed into uh, a constant part, which is represented in orange, and a turbulent part. So, the total force due to the wind uh, can be written as one half times the density of the air times the aerolytic coefficient times the surface of the building uh, perpendicular to the wind times the constant part of the wind plus the fluctuating part uh, squared. Now this can be shown to be equal to a constant part, an average force, and a turbulent force uh, given by this expression with u uh, varying with time. Now, um, in a constant flow, so the first part, you have of course a constant force, but you can also have some dynamic effects which we, we will discuss in this video. The first one is dynamic vortex excitation. The second one is self-excited vibration, so it's mainly instabilities in the form of galloping, divergence and flutter. For the turbulent flow, which will be discussed in a next video, you will have a dynamic force which can lead to resonance. The interaction between the object and the flow can cause excessive vibrations to the object, even leading to instabilities. So this is these problems that we are going to discuss in this video. So the first problem we're going to address is called vortex-induced vibrations. To understand vortex-induced vibrations, we can have a look at this first numerical simulation where you see that uh, a cylinder is placed on, uh, in a constant flow in that direction. And you see the formation of these alternating vortices behind the cylinder which have a certain frequency. Now this frequency and the formation of the vortices really depends on the shape of the object. You see the, here with a triangle or a square or even a square that you put at 45 degree or a, a cylinder, these vortices are very different. You see also here that the orientation of the object, if you take an oval object, will be different. In some cases you will barely have formation of vortices, but in most cases you will have these vortices forming. Now let's look at some experimental uh, tests to demonstrate this effect of vortex-induced vibration. Vortex-induced vibration is a result of aerodynamic forces on a body. In this simple demonstration, a balloon vibrates in the free stream of a laboratory wind tunnel. We will start from the beginning and explain how this phenomenon works. The open wind tunnel in this video is very simple and easy to build. Air enters the wind tunnel from the top and is driven by four standard computer vans which are controlled by a laboratory power supply. A honeycomb is installed to reduce the swirl of the flow. Two screens further homogenize the streamwise velocity. Finally, the flow exits the wind tunnel as a free jet and excites a model balloon which is suspended by springs. The balloon is like a circular cylinder and can be modeled by a mass spring system which moves alternatingly to the left side and to the right side. The dynamical system can be described by the two equations on the right side of the slide. Equation 1 is the resonance frequency of the mechanical system. 
Equation 2 is the vortex oscillation frequency based on a typical Struhall number of 0 0.2. If the resonance frequency of the mechanical system coincides with the vortex shedding frequency, then the balloon vibrates by the von Karman type of vortex shedding. It is therefore important to choose parameters carefully. To give you an example, the parameters in this video are the following. It is interesting to note that the mass of the balloon is relatively small. Actually, the mass of the springs is larger and therefore considered in the equation. This gives a mechanical frequency of approximately 6 Hz. The frequency of the vortex shedding is approximately 7 Hz. Note that these frequencies should be the same but can be slightly different. The system will then adjust itself to some extent. Here you can see the oscillation again if the velocity is chosen correctly. Now the velocity of the wind tunnel is doubled. As a result there is no resonance anymore and the balloon does not oscillate at a certain frequency anymore. Now when the flow hit the cylinder it results in alternating vortices which induce a sinusoidal force to the cylinder. The frequency of this force is related to the wind speed through the relationship Fv is equal to st over d times u, where st is the stroll number. Now, if we want to rewrite this equation, you have uh, st equal Fv times d over u, and we know that the frequency of the vortices is related to uh, the, the speed of the flow in the vortices and the wavelength through the well-known relationship uc is equal to lambda times fv. So if we replace uh, in this equation fv by uc over lambda we get this expression and we see that the Struhl number is um, the multiplication of two factors. The, one, the first one is the relative velocity of the flow in the vortices and the incoming flow and the second one is a ratio of uh, the diameter of the cylinder divided by the wavelength of these vortices. In a cylinder, uc over u is 0 0.5, d over lambda is uh, 0 0.4, and so we know that the Stroll number is equal to 0 0.2. One thing that is very important to remember is that in this phenomenon, the force applied to the cylinder is perpendicular to the flow, which is uh, not the same as for when you have a constant flow and a constant force, which is in the direction of the flow. So as a summary, vortex-induced vibration is caused by uh, the constant flow hitting an object and the obstacle causes the flow to deviate, create vortices, and these vortices make uh, the object vibrate. The force applied to the object is perpendicular to the flow and the frequency at which these vortices occur depend both on the shape of the object and the velocity of the flow. Now to understand the phenomenon of self-excited vibration we can look at this very simple model where we have a mass on a spring and a damper which uh, undergoes a flow from the left here. Uh, there is no external force applied to the mass and the only force is the result of the aerodynamic interaction with the flow. So the um, equation of motion is written like this. Note that the mass is uh, a mass per unit of length uh, where uh, L is actually the depth, so perpendicular to this plane. Um, now if we explicit the force excited by the fluid, uh, we can see that it's made of two parts and uh, it is of course a function of the density of the fluid, of the velocity of the fluid and of the size of the body. So H and L are the thickness here and the depth across, I mean perpendicular to uh, the plane. And there are also functions of aerodynamic coefficients. One of them is depending on the velocity of the elastic body and the second one is depending on the displacement of this elastic body. 
Now to simplify, uh, we will write this in non-dimensional form. So for example, the displacement in divided by the length the time is multiplied by the natural frequency, etc. And in the non-dimensional form, we have now these two um, components of the force applied by the fluid. The two term can be approximated with a third order expansion. So for the term depending on the velocity of the elastic body, we have a term beta 1 and a third order term beta 3. Uh, for the second term, depending on the displacement of the elastic body, we have gamma 1 and gamma 3. So we now have the equations of motion where we see that the damping term will vary with the fluid velocity ur, but also with the velocity of the uh, elastic body, and uh, a stiffness part which varies also with fluid velocity and amplitude of elastic body displacement. Now the frequency response function of a one degree of freedom system is given by this expression that you all know by now. It can also be written in the pole residue form where we have uh, here R which is the residue and lambda which is the pole. So if we equate these two equations we can see that lambda is minus psi omega n plus j omega d and R is minus j over 2m omega d. Here we are interested in lambda, so if we represent lambda in the complex plane, uh, we see that it, ha it has a, a real part and an imaginary part. As you see, the real part is negative and the imaginary part is omega d. So the amplitude uh, of the vector, so the distance from the origin is, uh, can be shown to be omega n. Omega d, as we see here, is the imaginary part. The real part is minus psi omega n, so that the angle here is given by psi. Now, if we look at uh, the impulse response of a system, it can uh, also be given by a pole residue model, where you see that you have the residue times e to the power of the pole uh, times t, and the complex conjugate here. So since this pole is given by uh, minus psi omega n plus j omega d, you see that there is an oscillatory part, uh, but that there is also the exponential part. And what happens is that if this psi becomes negative, so if the pole goes into the region uh, with a positive real part, it leads to instability because we have an exponential with a positive uh, term and so uh, an exponential that grows with time. Now, if we apply this to our problem of self-excited vibrations, what we see is that if um, the damping uh, becomes negative, then we will have some oscillatory instability. Uh, here we will consider just uh, to, to look at the, the stability limit, the, the first two terms. So when 2 psi minus beta 1 is equal to 0, we have a damping that becomes negative, so this part is negligible for the moment. And this is when a phenomenon called galloping will occur. And this galloping can occur in our body in translation or in rotation. And in the case that it is a rotational instability, it is called rotational flutter. Divergence occurs when uh, here the stiffness terms becomes uh, zero, so this is a static instability. And again, here we are looking at the first two terms to uh, determine this lim limit of stability. Now for large amplitudes, this uh, second term can uh, have an effect. So even though this is an unstable behavior which would lead to infinite displacements of the body, uh, as you see, the, the, the sign here in front is, in, is positive, where this one is negative. So this will tend to stabilize the motion and will lead to what is called limit cycle oscillation. So the body will oscillate with large amplitudes, but not infinite ones. So to summarize, the main mechanism of self-excited vibration is that the fluid structure interaction will change the uh, effective stiffness and damping as seen from the mechanical system. A static or a dynamic instability can occur at certain wind speeds. 
And as every structure is subject to small vibration levels uh, all the time, instability will lead to the magnification of these existing vibrations. And this can cause fatigue damage over the long term or even failure of the structure if the vibration levels are too high. So this simplified one-dimensional model helps us to understand the origin of those instabilities, whether it is galloping, flutter or divergence. Now let us look at a graphical way to better understand the appearance of these instabilities. We can also have a graphical interpretation of these instabilities. So when uh, the damping goes to zero, uh, due to the, the, the speed of the flow. Uh, we have galloping, so what we see here is that initially the pole is in the left plane, so it is stable, and as um, the velocity of the flow increases, you see that the pole follows this line, and once it reaches here the imaginary axis, this is when the damping is equal to zero and you have instability. For variable uh, stiffness, you see that in this case the pole is also following as you increase the value of velocity, you see that uh, the stiffness is uh, decreasing and at some point it reaches here uh, a, a zero stiffness. Now for multiple degree of freedom system, different uh, instabilities can occur. So of course you can have divergence and galloping of a uh, single mode. But you can also have coupled mode effects, so which it's called a coupled mode flutter. And in this case, what you have is that uh, as you increase the wind velocity, you see that this pole is uh, following this line. This pole is following this line. And as they tend to get very close, you see that this one is deviated to the right and at some point crosses the imaginary axis due to the interaction with the other mode and it causes instability. Let's summarize, when you have a constant flow, uh, you have a constant force on the body, but you can also have dynamic uh, phenomenon, like dynamic vortex excitation. So when the flow uh, create the interaction between the flow and the object will create some vortices uh, behind the object. And you will see that in this case, there is some frequency associated to phen the phenomenon, which depends on the shape of the object, uh, but also on the velocity of the flow. Uh, another phenomenon is self-excited vibration. So this is when the flow actually brings energy in the system, which can lead to instability, so negative damping or a negative stiffness in the, the form of uh, galloping, uh, divergence and flutter. The case of turbulent flow has not been treated here, but is the subject of another video. It creates dynamic forces which can lead to resonance, but doesn't lead to any kind of instability. So this video was aimed at explaining the main phenomena uh, linked to flow-induced vibration. So we discuss vortex-induced vibrations as well as instabilities in the form of uh, flutter, galloping and diversions. In a video called Vibration Problems, we will show examples of these phenomena on real structures and objects.